Good day to you. I'm Carl Falk. This is the Falcon Around podcast. Hopefully you've had a good week. There are sports being played. There's sports on the horizon. There may be more sports coming. And through it all, we've got more and more controversy, more and more discussion points. So let's dive right in. We're going to start at a place that I don't spend a whole lot of time talking about. I don't spend a whole lot of time watching NASCAR. I'm not all that interested in NASCAR. But being a human being and being a man of compassion, what happened this week in NASCAR makes it the place you have to start any sports discussion. This week, the race was at Talladega. The race concluded yesterday as we record this Tuesday morning. The race went on yesterday. And the race was secondary to anything that happened leading up to it. Ryan Blaney ended up winning the race. And it was a photo finish. It was a great race. And the first event that there were fans back at the event. So that in itself was noteworthy that we're now getting to a point where we're getting people back in the stands. Now, as we recover from this coronavirus or as a country, we've had outbreaks and surges in Florida and Texas, Arizona, some of the warmer weather states that had been somewhat lower in their numbers, but now probably because people are starting to feel safe and not following the safety protocols, there have been spikes. And to have race fans back at a NASCAR event was a great thing. NASCAR as a reaction to the protests, the Black Lives Matter movement that this entire country is starting to recognize and hopefully embracing NASCAR is a reaction to that last week made an announcement that they were going to ban Confederate flags. And while that may seem like something that you go, okay, yeah, why wouldn't you? That's down South where NASCAR is huge. Redneck people who look like me, they want their Confederate flag. They, they are old school. This is the Deep South, and it didn't go over well. It didn't go over well to the point where a driver, Ray Cicerelli, who never won anything, and he's a guy who, a marginal player, if if at all, in the NASCAR circuit, decided he was going to step away in protest. Now, he posted on his Facebook page a horrifically grammar, grammarly incorrect post it was written by that of a fifth grader who didn't do well in english his reasons for it and it the post i'll give him credit for this it was less about the symbol of the confederate flag and more about freedom of speech that's all i give the guy credit for he's he's an idiot and if you have a job that potentially pays you very well. I don't know where racist rally is going to replace the income that he earned as a bad NASCAR driver. There are things that you got to go along with. And the Confederate flag is a symbol of racism in this country. So if you're hell bent on that being the thing you want to stand on, you're supporting racism, pure and simple. Before the race yesterday, there was a flag that flew over in a plane. If you've ever been to a sporting event, planes always circling around with messages. It had a Confederate flag, and the message was defund NASCAR. There were people lined up outside the gate with Confederate flags everywhere. Again, this in Talladega, Alabama, the deep south. Racism is still king in the south. And it showed itself in a way I don't think anybody thought it ever would. NASCAR has exactly one black driver, Bubba Wallace. He drives the number 43 car. And if you know anything about NASCAR, number 43 was the king, Richard Petty, forever. Arguably the greatest driver in NASCAR history and certainly one of the most noteworthy drivers in NASCAR history. And that's who he works for. Well, Bubba Wallace returned to his garage on Sunday and found a noose in the garage. Now, conspiracy theories theories already abounding that there was no noose. It was a 
rope that was broken from the garage door, all these things. I don't know if there was a noose. I don't know if there wasn't a noose. I find it hard to believe that Bubba Wallace and his people would make up the fact that there's a noose. Where does that come from? And just this morning, shortly before I started broadcasting this podcast, TMZ is reporting that a noose was found in a garage at Sonoma Raceway in California. So, again, maybe this is becoming a thing. There is a lot of things going on right now that people are pointing out, well, that's racist, and there's discussion points as to why something may or may not be racially insensitive. There are no discussion points when it comes to a noose. A noose is about as horrific of a thing that you can ever put up. So for Bubba Wallace to walk into his garage or drive into his garage at the NASCAR track, that's a sanctity. That's where the crews do their work, hang out. Nobody but authorized personnel allowed in there. And to find a noose is just an unbelievable act. Whoever did that, it's a hate crime. Pure and simple. They need to go to jail for a long time. And there is no sensitivity training to get some jackass who thinks it's cool to hang a noose in the garage of a black man. There's no sensitivity training for that. It's just get the hell out of society, dude, because we no longer want you because all you're doing is bringing us down. The fact that it was in the garage, in the a track where only authorized personnel should make it easy for NASCAR and the FBI who is investigating this as a hate crime to figure out who did that. And of course I mentioned Ray Cicerelli earlier, the driver who walked away. He has become an internet suspect similar to Richard Jewell, the Atlanta bombing. You know, once you point a finger at somebody, it's like, Oh, it's gotta be him. Well, the only reason anyone thinks that is because he stepped away over the protest to the Confederate flag. There is no evidence, no smoking gun, if you will. But these parts of the track have to be covered by cameras. There's got to be photographic evidence with that. And eventually the FBI is going to find out who did this. It was something that Bubba Wallace stood in took like a man and took like a strong man. And, you know, you think of the the impactful leaders of our country who faced so much negativity and especially the civil rights activists who we've now known are just such great people. When they were presented with adversity, they got stronger. And Bubba Wallace was presented with an incredible amount of adversity that nobody should ever have to deal with. And he stood stronger. And I don't know anything about Bubba Wallace, I don't, other than that he's the only black NASCAR driver on the circuit. But the way he has handled the last few days could not have been more impressive to me. The things he said, the way he's reacted. The race went on yesterday. And he was in contention. He ran out of the gas and ended up finishing 14. But he was in contention, which would have been an unbelievable story. The race was won by, as it turns out, a good friend of Bubba Wallace, Ryan Blaney. But what happened before the race, and I would say the NASCAR fans who saw this probably hated it. Now, Bubba Wallace said Black Lives Matter on his car. That was controversial in itself, let alone the Confederate flag ban. Again, NASCAR people aren't the most progressive crowd. So their consternation over Black Lives Matter being painted on a NASCAR, having a black driver, having the Confederate flag. Well, how do you think they felt when they saw this? Here's the beginning starting grid, literally, by every driver and crew member in NASCAR. Check this out. All of NASCAR's drivers have rallied around Bubba Wallace. The NASCAR Cup Series, lone black driver, after what happened here yesterday afternoon. 
The drivers, led by reigning Cup Series champion Kyle Busch in green, and their crews, the entire garage area, has rallied around Bubba Wallace and the number 43 today. Because yesterday afternoon, a noose was found hanging in the garage stall of Bubba's race car. In the NASCAR Cup garage area, a secure area where access is limited to competitors, officials, and track staff. A despicable act by someone flying directly in the face of NASCAR's efforts to build a culture that is diverse, equal, and welcome. That's why Richard Petty is here today and why Ryan Blaney, Bubba's friends, competitors, and on-track foes have closed ranks around him. When that window net goes up later today, racing is the great equalizer. Everybody's six foot four, 240 pounds. Everybody has 600 horsepower. No one is white, black, brown, or yellow. They are all racers. And they are all our heroes. Just an amazing emotional scene at Talladega. And you see Bubba Wallace overcome by emotion, being hugged by several drivers, and, and notably the king, Richard Petty. Petty's 82 years old, hasn't been to any of the NASCAR events since the restart after the pause for coronavirus. Obviously, being 82 years old, he has health concerns. He felt he had to be there, as he said, to hug his driver. And... You know, things that you never thought you'd see, essentially a Black Lives Matter march protest at a NASCAR event. And again, I, all I could think of, and I, I read some things, people in the crowd, their reaction to this it was not the same as my reaction. My reaction is, you know, out of a horrible situation, we have a great moment of solidarity. And, and I think that's something important as we go through this time, there's going to be horrible situations. But to take those great moments and the moments that we move forward with are, are the key to healing and learning. And hopefully some people in the crowd who, when they got to the race, still thought a Confederate flag should be able to be brought in. Hopefully they looked at this and, and maybe it moved them a little bit. Maybe they understood the fact that hanging in, hanging in noose in the garage of a black driver at a NASCAR track isn't okay. And as one jackass in the crowd who was interviewed said, well, I thought it was funny. No, dude, it's not funny. What's funny is how stupid you are. That's funny, and it's comical that anyone could be that stupid. Horrible situation, great answer to it and, and again Bubba Wallace after the race going over to people in the crowd some people in the crowd who had never been to a NASCAR race but because of what happened wanted to go to support Bubba Wallace just a, a great thing came out of an incredibly bad situation so hopefully NASCAR going forward gets a handle on this Hopefully NASCAR finds out and the FBI finds out who did this. And I, I got to think, again, the evidence has to be pretty clear for the FBI. There's got to be a, a ton of cameras. There's got to be a, a way to track who went in there. Authorized personnel only in that part of the racetrack. So that immediately narrows your suspect pool down greatly. This is something that needs to be figured out. But I thought it was a great moment for NASCAR. And many people won't re remember that Ryan Blaney won the event. 
but everyone will always remember at Talladega that moment before the national anthem when the entire NASCAR community and, and the entire field pushed his car forward and stood behind him at the national anthem. Just a great moment out of a horrific circumstance for NASCAR. And, you know, again, this was the first race back with fans. So now we're getting things back to normal, but there's that reminder again, things are not normal, especially when it comes to what's going on with the social concerns right now in our country. Let's hope we don't have any more of this crap. But again, as I said, TMZ is reporting this morning that it's Sonoma, California, another NASCAR track on the circuit. There was a noose in a garage found there. So I'm, I'm guessing, unfortunately, this isn't the end of this ignorance. And this is only going to be part of this story. But uh, I, too, stand with Bubba. Go Bubba Wallace. I don't know enough about NASCAR, but I have a new favorite driver in NASCAR. Switch from one sport that did something well to another sport that could never seemingly do anything well. That's Major League Baseball. Last night, it came down from the commissioner. We're going to have a season 60 games. Here we go. Let's, let's have at it. This negotiation between the Players Association and the owners has been, for lack of a better way of saying it, just a clusterfuck. This has been horrible. Both sides should be ashamed of themselves. Both sides have cost themselves, in my opinion, hundreds of millions of dollars going forward. They have lost fans. They have angered fans. There are people who are struggling to pay their mortgages, pay their car payments, people out of work. Everyone is trying to get through this pandemic, not only emotionally, but financially. We look for anything to get us through. If you're like me, somebody who watches sports all the time, I've gone through Netflix. I'm done with Netflix. I, 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 it's like going through the entire internet. Yeah, I, there's nothing left. Amazon, Hulu, I'm, I'm done with all. I, I, I need sports. I've got nothing left to watch. I've got nothing more to do. Baseball can be that. And, and for a sport that's been trying to get back to its glory days, to get back to where it was the national pastime, the opportunity for baseball to step in during this time where there's nothing else to watch, this was an opportunity for baseball to not only garner new fans, but to bring back old fans, fans they may have lost when they canceled the World Series in 94. And yet both the owners and the players stood on their principles, which the principles is their pocketbook, and decided, hmm, you know, I, I really can't go to work for only a few million dollars. I need all of my million dollars. Meanwhile, baseball had an opportunity, again, to grow the sport a little bit this year, gain some momentum going into next year. And the real factor for me, the, the biggest thing, is that after the 2021 season, which I know that's a year and a half away, but this is going to go quickly now. In a year and a half, there is no CBA in Major League Baseball. Based on the fact that the owners and players can't get together to figure out a shortened season and come up with financial guidelines, come up with changes to the game guidelines to implement a new shortened season, a one-time deal. You know, there there are long-term deals where, you know, I'm going to buy a house, it's a 30-year mortgage, you got to figure everything out, or you're going to buy something at a garage sale today because you want to use it for the next week and a half. It's a lot easier to figure that week and a half use out than the 30-year mortgage. And they couldn't do this. This was left to the commissioner to implement the season because the last proposal sent forth by the owners to the players was rejected. So the players who had been to a man tweeting out when and where, meaning tell us when to show up and where to show up and we're ready to go, 
were forced to have a season implemented to them by the commission. It is a 60-game season. It will hopefully begin on July 24th. There have been training sessions going on as these negotiations were being put out there. The training sessions generally have been taking place down in Florida. And this week, there was news out of Florida that several new cases involving some of the players and coaches and support staff at some of these training facilities have shut down the training facilities. The Phillies had eight cases of coronavirus in their facility. They have shut down. They trained in the same town with the Toronto Blue Jays, who had a few cases. They also shut down. The Mets and Yankees are moving their operations from Florida to New York. They will train at Yankee Stadium and City Field, respectively. It's crazy to think that while these negotiations are going on, there is still the ability to be healthy enough and safe enough for the players to do this. Now, I do think that the players will find a way to, for the most part, be safe. But let's face it, you're talking about young guys who have money. Ball players do a few things every day. They go to the park, they work out, and they hit the town after games. And again, I'm generalizing, but it's what ball players do. Well, it's going to be a little different, I think, going forward. But there's still going to be young guys who are going to go out after games for a couple beers. And bars are back open. The places to go are back in business. So the opportunity's there. And that guy who goes out, who may con- contract coronavirus, is going to bring it into the locker room. How do they handle that? There's been talk, because there will be no fans at the stadium, that each player will be given a luxury box or a suite as their dressing room. So that's how they will socially distance themselves from that. But again, you're still looking at players in the dugout. Will they be masked all the time? Is that something that needs to happen? There are so many safety protocols that need to be figured out. What happens if a player tests positive? for the coronavirus. Is there a mandated time he is out? Or is it a case-by-case example? Here's the other thing. Today, as we record this, it is July, or it is June 22nd, 23rd. I'm sorry, June 23rd. They want to start July 24th. Players aren't in camp. They haven't announced any preseason games. Pitchers, I'm sure, have been throwing But the reason spring training happens every year is to get players safely ready for their season. I'm going to use Garrett Cole of the New York Yankees as an example in this situation. Garrett Cole signed a $300 plus million contract this last offseason to be a member of the Yankees. He now is going to be counted on to be a huge part of the Yankees season for 60 games. So roughly every fifth day, that means 12 starts. 12 starts of Garrett Cole this year, roughly, give or take. Garrett Cole, for $30 million this year, and it won't be, it's prorated, so it'll be a third of that. It'll be about $10 million, roughly. He is going to be asked to have a shortened preseason, go out there every fifth day, pitch the Yankees to a championship that nobody will respect and nobody will look at and go, well, they won the championship in 2012. Wasn't that the year of Corona? Yeah, that doesn't count. This season should not have a champion. It should just be an exhibition. Be like spring training. Give us something to watch. Give us an opportunity to enjoy games. But are we going to award Cy Young Awards, MVPs, Are we going to have a batting title? Are we going to have any sort of conclusion at the end of this that anybody looks at with any deal of respect? This is an opportunity for the players to get their salary and for the owners 
to get the playoff television revenue that happens after the season. The reality is it's a joke. And back to Garrett Cole, you're asking a guy like that, who the Yankees have invested for seven, eight, was it nine years? I don't remember the exact. You're asking him to risk the health of his right arm in a season that doesn't count. It's horrific. I'm a Mets fan. And all I can think of is, in this season, let Jacob deGrom throw maybe by August 1st, maybe mid-August. Don't get him back for opening day. I don't want to see him on opening day. I'm not worried about this year. Again, I'm looking forward to watching baseball, as I mentioned. But this bastardized season is just going to be a disaster. There are going to be injuries that impact teams, not just for this year, but going forward for years to come. It is a horrible idea at this late date to have this go on. And furthermore, not only is it a bad idea to have it go on now, as we go forward and as we look at baseball in the future, the repercussions of this year, the things that did or did not happen, are going to impact negotiations after next year. Think of the things that are going to be a part of this year. The universal DH is for this year. Now, many thought it would be for this year and next, and if that was the case, the designated hitter would be there to stay. And as somebody who watches National League Baseball, and I'm sure many of you out there are not in agreement with this statement, I hate the designated hitter. It's just not something I enjoy. And people say, you want to see a pitcher hit? No. I want to see a small ball being played. I want to see the strategy and the approach to how you play the game with the fact that a pitcher is going to bat eventually whether or not you take them out, all of the things that go along with it. To me, those are the factors that you have to look at and you can make your way around it. And it makes the game better, in my opinion. Now, you may not share that opinion. That's fine. But the designated hitter will be in baseball 2022. (coughs) So that is a fact that's going to happen going forward, for sure. You also have to look at the realignment that's going to happen this year. You're going to have teams that play each other that never really play each other. You know, the DH is a factor when it comes to roster setup, but you're going to be playing teams. You build your teams to play the teams you're going to play. And this is going to be a very different thing. They talked about, uh, uh, the international tiebreaker rule. Softball uses this in tournaments. If if you've ever seen girls softball, they have all these tournaments, and if they get sex innings, runner on second, one out. That's how they try to expedite the game. They did that in the minor leagues. The, this is just a way of not playing extra innings. They're going to expand the playoffs. All of these things that they're trying this year, they're going to work to implement going forward because baseball thinks that they have a problem not having enough fans. Well, they don't have enough fans. And unfortunately, you look at me, I'm your average baseball fan. I am the demographic that watches baseball. So now, not just for this year, but going forward, you're changing the game of baseball and you're doing so to attract new fans. Newsflash, you're not attracting news f- new fans. People love baseball who are my age and older because when we were little kids, there wasn't a million different sports to play. We played baseball. We played baseball every day, whether it was wiffle ball or baseball, whatever the case may be. It was something to do because we didn't have lacrosse. We didn't play soccer. We didn't do all of these other sports. We did them occasionally, but nobody knew enough about them to play them every day. Baseball, we played every day. So when it came time to play real baseball, we didn't play t-ball at three years old. We already knew baseball and we liked it. We liked playing. And from there, 
the game became part of our lives. Now, there are a lot of options for kids to play. At three and four years old, kids play T-ball. One out of every 25 kids might enjoy T-ball at three years old. They want to run around, which is why soccer is such a great sport for little kids, because all they do is run around. They don't have to kick the ball. They just get to run. What's better than, uh, than that as a little kid? They end up hating baseball because baseball is boring if you don't understand it and you don't enjoy it. And they stop playing and they stop watching. That's, to me, the real problem with why baseball isn't as popular as it used to be. When's the last time you drove by a park? And I'm not talking about coronavirus time. I mean last summer. You drove by a park and you saw a bunch of kids playing pickup baseball where you had a dead a right field. Nobody was there. If you hit it there, it's an out. You don't see that anymore. It just doesn't happen. So because of that, all of these kids are growing up with baseball as something that they play only in school or only in their summer travel league. Most kids don't enjoy it. And they don't watch it. And that's the real problem with baseball. So you're changing the rules to attract new viewers that you're not going to attract. All you're really doing is taking people like me and turning them off. And Trevor Bauer talked about this. Trevor Bauer is a guy who's very outspoken. And for a long time, people thought, uh, shut up, Trevor Bauer. He's become the voice of reason. He's talking about how they're killing the sport because they're trying to do things for a year and a half when in a year and a half, the real labor negotiations are going to happen and baseball is going to be a different sport then because there's going to be another work stoppage. Think about that. In three years, you're likely to have two of them be very much a shortened season. So everyone who freaks out about the record books and the sanctity of the records in baseball, you know, think about that. We, we just came off of watching Long Gone Summer, the bad – 30 for 30 on ESPN about Mac and Sammy chasing Roger Maris's record and the sanctity of, of the records in baseball 60 game season this year. What's the home run leader going to have 17, 20. Yeah. Put that in the books with an asterisk by it. So now we, it's okay to use asterisks. That's okay. It wasn't before, but it is now. I guess I should be happy. I guess I should just step back and say, you know what? Baseball's coming. I'll get to watch it. I'll get to enjoy summer evenings having these games on. But the reality is when this season starts to wind down in September and a team is 20 and 23 and they're in the mix, no, this is not a real baseball season. All this is is an opportunity For the billionaires to get their playoff money, that's the owner. And the millionaires to continue to collect their salaries, that's the players. For us fans, we once again got shafted. We always get shafted. You know, I've always said the one way to strike back at fans and owners, by fans to owners and players, is to not go. Well, that actually is going to work because we're not going to go. Not by choice, but we can't go. So the television ratings will dictate everything this year. But they're all going to make money, and it's just a mess. And Rob Manfred, you've done a terrible job with this one, and you've got a bigger job ahead of you in a year and a half. And I I really don't think he's the right guy for the job going forward. It is a bad, bad situation. My next topic is one that I seem to hit every other week. It is the fact that the Buffalo Sabres owners, Kim and Terry Pagula, are just, they're good people, they're smart people, but they're idiots. You ever have that smart friend who's an idiot? You know what I mean. The person who's really book smart. And when you find out they're book smart, you look at them and go, How the hell are you smart? You're one of the dumbest people I know. And yet, you're smart. How does that happen? There are people like that. I'm envious of them because I'm an idiot and everyone can see I'm an idiot. I don't hide any intelligence because I can't. I don't 
have that to afford. But the Sabres, Terry and Kim Pagula, they hide their intelligence every time they open their mouths because they say and do something incredibly stupid. Last week, as we did the show, the breaking news just before we went on was that the Pagulas were going to move on from general manager Jason Bottrell. They were going to replace him with senior vice president of business administration Kevin Adams. Kevin Adams was a pretty good hockey player, won a cup with the Carolina Hurricanes, has a lot of respect as a person, has as much experience when it comes to being a general manager in the National Hockey League as, well, me. So none. So you took a guy that you like because he works in your organization. You didn't develop him for this role. You didn't work him into the scouting department. You didn't move him into an assistant general manager's position. You didn't move him into a general manager's position in Rochester to kind of get your feet wet. No, you, without going outside the organization, without having a single interview for an established hockey individual, you've hired a guy to run your franchise who has no experience and no qualifications other than the fact that he's a very good guy and has a few qualities that the Pagulas believe in. Now, I got to say, Kevin Adams might turn out to be great. He might turn out to be every bit the general manager for the Sabres that Brandon Bean has become for the Bills. Very well may happen that way. I was a little skeptical of Ralph Kruger when he was hired last year. And I remember on my radio show when he was hired, having Joe Yurden on, who does a great job covering the Sabres, formerly of the Athletic. And Joe said, just hold on. He's very good. You'll be shocked. And I was. I didn't like the fact that he was stubborn and didn't put a guy like Jeff Skinner, who they just gave a bunch of money to play in my opinion, with Jack Eichel. So you take a 40-goal score and you move him down to a guy who scored, I think it was 13, 15 goals, because now you're asking him to do something you didn't have him do before. I thought Kruger was stubborn with Rasmus Dahlin at times, who to me is one of the building blocks of this franchise. But overall, when you heard the players at the end of the year, and specifically Jack Eichel, who is the franchise just go on and on about what a great coach Kruger is and how much they enjoyed playing for him. That shows something. You didn't hear that before. So maybe the coach was right. Maybe that was the right hire. I mean, they've had five other coaches, the Pagulas, that they've hired, and they've all been wrong, whether it be Ron Rolston or Dan Bilesma uh, they've hired now six coaches in the nine years they've owned the franchise. Kevin Adams is their fourth general manager. Four GMs, six coaches, nine years, not one playoff game. Do you think the problem was the six coaches? Do you think the problem was all four of the general managers? No, the problem is within the organization and it's at the very top and it is the person who is the president of this organization Kim Pagula. Kim Pagula is the problem with the Buffalo Sabres. Kim Pagula has become the loudest voice in the organization and it's now apparent but for years it had been rumored that she was the loudest voice in the organization behind the scenes. So now that she's in the forefront, we at least know she's the loudest voice. The problem goes back many years. And it's not a new problem, and it's not a problem that's going to go away because Kim Pagula is not going to go away. Three weeks ago when she said, now four weeks ago, when she said Jason Bottrell was going to be their GM going forward, she also said that the, the biggest goal or their biggest focal point going forward was going to be to maintain their family's lifestyle. Well, now things are different. Terry Pagula said 
that the biggest goal is to be effective, efficient, and economic. Let me translate that for you. We spent too much money. We didn't get anything out of it. Now we're going cheap. Mike Harrington of the Buffalo News is a great writer and covers the Sabres exceptionally well. He also pulls no punches. In the Zoom call to introduce or to announce the firing of Jason Bottrell and introduce Kevin Adams as the new guy, Mike Harrington asked Kim Pagula about the perception that she's the biggest problem. Mike Harrington, Buffalo News here. Um, the question is mostly for Kim. As John Morrow talked about, you certainly made a change here in these three weeks. Do you regret your statement? And secondly, and two other quick points. Do you regret that answer? Secondly, why another first-time GM when that route has failed you twice? And lastly, ultimately, why should anyone have faith in you as the team president, given the way every Virtual, every former employee, whether it's a coach, a GM, an executive, or another worker, points to your scattershot leadership as the number one problem in this organization. Well, um, Mike, uh, no, I, I don't regret saying that, Jason, because that was truly, that was our intent. Um, and that was the direction that Terry and I both talked about when I talked to John three weeks ago. Um, and like I said, you know, there has been a lot of things going on in this world right now. And there, we are not the only club having to take some deep looks and how we move forward. And I think that's really what this was all about. Um, as far as, um, I forgot why, uh, how you named it, but um, as far as, listen, when when we, when I, and just, you know, although I am named president, you're correct, but Tara and I were both, we're a tag team in this. But listen, we, we're gonna keep trying. Like this, this is something that, you know, the Sabres have been a love of ours for a long time, Terry even more so. Um, but And this is something that we're very passionate about. And we are not going to sit there and keep saying, well, you know what, we tried it this way and it didn't work. So let's not do, let's not try anymore. And I think this is what it's about. We understand that, you know, listen, uh, you know, on the bill side, it took us several times there. We got, you know, we feel like right now we got the right people. We're going to keep trying. We feel like Kevin is the right person. And we felt like at the time that we made those other decisions, whether it was leadership, whether it was coaches or, um, or GMs, we felt at that time that they were the right person for the organization. And that doesn't always uh, pan out the way it's supposed to. But um, I will tell you, know, you guys and, and the community that we're going to continue to try uh, and get us to where we need to be. Talk about an uncomfortable question to have to answer. Well, and she didn't answer it. And but to Kim Pagula's credit, and this shows something about her, she didn't react to that question. She didn't react negatively. You can see Terry wasn't comfortable sitting next to her. But the reality is the Pagulas have been part of the problem since they bought the team. I watched, uh, I listened to a podcast with Matthew Barnaby and he had Mike Harrington on and, and they talked about this began back in the early days of the Pagula ownership when Chris Erhoff and Ville Leno were signed for a combined $70 million and they were essentially forced on the general manager. This was the Pagulas wanting these players. They were disasters. Both of them ended up being horrible additions. Just because you own the team doesn't mean it's in your own best interest to make decisions about the team. And now Kevin Adams is put in a position where he's now got to rebuild the organization. Kim Pagula said this is not a rebuild. But when you fire all your scouts and all the people in Rochester, it is a rebuild. It's a rebuild of the organization, maybe not of the team. The team is, in my opinion, halfway there. They've got six good NHL forwards. They've got three good NHL defensemen. They're halfway there. If you can figure out a way to get three more NHL defensemen and six more NHL forwards, oh, and a goalie, 
that's a quality individual. And you can do those things. I think you have a chance to be a good team. The reality is effective, efficient, economic. Sam Reinhardt's contract is due. They're not going to pay him, in my opinion. They're not going to give him a long-term deal. He'll likely go elsewhere and get that deal. Now, Sam Reinhardt, is he worth the Jeff Skinner money? No, I don't believe he is. Is he a good player? Yeah, I do think he's a good player. And in the right situation, I think he could be a very good player. But again, all of these decisions now come down to Kevin Adams. I'm going to go back to Mike Harrington talking about Kevin Adams and why he is an incredibly questionable hire as this general manager. Take a listen. What can we now expect out of Kevin Adams? I, I played with him in, in Carolina, hardworking player, details guy, you know, always in the gym when he wasn't, you know, away from the ice. Um, real good guy. Was this kind of like a, was this, were they waiting, kind of grooming him, being part of VP of business operations and maybe one day, or was this just kind of shocked you and me and everyone else? I, it was, I, I literally can barely speak about it now. I mean, he's a good guy. Obviously he's got a great career. He won a cup in Carolina, but who gets to become a GM? just because you're in the next office and you've known the owners for nine years. He was coaching the kids' academy at Harbor Center, their practice ring, for five years. Mm -hmm. You know, he was the business guy for a year. They make him the GM. I mean, people groom themselves to be a GM. Even you look at Chris Drury and Danny Briere, the great Sabre stars from 15 years ago, are grooming themselves in the front office of the hockey world. With Briere and Philly and and his deal with the, the team in Maine and Drury, the assistant GM with the Rangers, you don't just suddenly be named a GM. That's just ownership wanting to have someone that they can really have a lot of impact on. And I feel bad for Kevin Adams. He's in a terrible spot. And then yesterday, after the owner's press conference ended, the firing started, and they had Kevin Adams calling people and firing them. I mean, that's just unbelievable to me. I mean, what is, like, Scotty, go back to your first question. What the hell is going on sure. here? You know, it's just, they, they, this ownership group came in as the white knights to save this franchise and win the Stanley Cup. And they are now, you know, they're giving Eugene Melnick a run for the craziest owners in the league. And they, people are laughing at them that they have no idea what they're doing. And again, if you're a Sabres fan, I'm sorry. This is just depressing to hear this. But the reality is you've put a guy, Kevin Adams, in a position to fail, not in a position to succeed. The Sabres tried at one point to have a hockey czar, Pat LaFontaine. Kim Pagula ran him off in four months, ran him off. They've had Darcy Regeer, Tim Murray, Jason Bottrell, and now Kevin Adams. They haven't given any of them more than uh, three, four years to develop any sort of consistency. The plan by Jason Batra was to build a winning culture in Rochester so that the players, when they're elevated and developed, go up to Buffalo and are used to winning and become winners. To say that Chris Taylor and his staff, who all have been fired, uh, by the way, all were given extensions and oh yeah, the Pagulas are not honoring those extensions, didn't develop players. I show you Victor Olofsson. Olofsson was a guy that was an afterthought, yet was one of the better power play goal scorers in the league this year. So yes, there was talent that came up. Pilot, who just signed in Russia, was somebody who was an afterthought that developed into an NHL player. They have talent coming in Dylan Cousins. The NHL draft lottery is Friday night. Should the Sabres get one of the top couple picks, maybe you get another superstar. Maybe you find your way into another really good piece. Maybe this eventually turns around. But in my opinion, as long as Kim Pagula has the say that she has, nothing changes. Definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. 
That's Kim Pagula's job so far in the nine years she's been the owner of the Buffalo Sabres. She's run off good people. She's promoted people who weren't capable of doing their job. She has continued to manipulate hockey operations in a way that you would think she's part of the scouting department, but has not. I, I just don't understand how somebody who's so intelligent, and she is, because you look at Harbor Center and all the things around the arena, that's Kim Pagula's brainchild. That was a great idea. That was a home run like no other. And yet, she can't figure out what she doesn't know. If you're a truly smart, smart person, maybe your best quality as a smart person is to know what you're not good at. Those are the people who are incredibly successful because nobody's good at everything. A smart person figures out their strengths and weaknesses and gets help on their weaknesses. Kim Pagula's arrogance won't allow her to get help with her weaknesses. They won't hire a czar of hockey operations because it would take power away from them. And you can't have that. So it is a bad situation in Buffalo, and it's a situation that's not getting better anytime soon. Finish up with a little return-to-work situation. Golf is back to work. They have played two tournaments since they've come back. This past week, Nick Watley was found to have the coronavirus. He was informed while he was warming up on the range for a second round. He then had to withdraw from the tournament and be placed in quarantine. There's likely to be more golfers who are going to test positive. We mentioned the baseball players. Hockey players are testing positive as hockey looks to regain their season or restart their season. The NBA bubble in Orlando is starting to crumble a little bit as some players test positive and others have decided they're not going to play. Kid who has had a breakout year this year for the Wizards is not going to go. He's an impending free agent. Why go play a couple games, risk injury, and put yourself at risk for losing a lifetime contract? And by lifetime contract, I mean a life-changing contract. Trevor Reza has visitation situation with his young young child he's not going to play because family's more important if you're going to be quarantined for a month or longer you may not be able to see your family your child so he's not going to play while all these leagues try to get back and we talked a lot about baseball the coronavirus is still there and it's going to impact things much more and while we look to football on the horizon We all hope that football is going to be played. A report came out this week that Clemson University, 23 football players have tested positive for the virus. Now, maybe that's good for Clemson because you've got a couple things at work here. One, the players who got it, they should be healed up and ready to go by the season, and they should be healthy through the season. Maybe that helps them develop a herd immunity of sorts within the team. But I think there's going to be times as we go through this and get closer where the reality of Corona still being there is going to slap us in the face. And I think all of these leagues' plans are going to be filled with contingencies. And I guarantee somewhere along the line, one of those contingencies is not going to be able to handle what needs to be done whether there's going to be a forfeit of a major game, a postponement of a major game, something along those lines. Think of an NFL season if there's 23 NFL players on one team that tests positive in a week. You have that situation. That team's out of the league for a couple weeks, minimum. And I don't think the league is set up with its schedule to be able to handle that. What do you do, postpone the whole league? So – While we're getting back to playing games and seeing games, the reality is the corona is still out there. 
and it's still going to affect things. So temper your expectations and just be hopeful that we get through this and get back to normal and get to see things. I don't think it's as soon as many people expect, but it's going to happen eventually. That's all for this week. Thanks for listening. I hope you have a great week. We'll talk next week. Thanks a lot. I'm Carl Falk. This is the Falcon Around Podcast.